So how about one trillion events per day with 100 servers? And when I mean events a day, I mean events that are not just key value pairs, I mean real time series events that has ID, timestamp, a bunch of other metadata columns. And when I talk about servers, I mean real commodity servers. I mean like those with spindles, with um, 128 gigabytes of RAM, with underpowered CPU. Put it another way, how about handling one billion events a day for just one dollar a day? And it, at the face of it, it looks like a very cool engineering challenge. And it's a very cool problem, technical problem to solve. But I want you to, be, to think about the bigger picture. At Tesla, cost efficiency, operation efficiency matters a lot. Tesla has a very big mission to accelerate the world's transition to the uh, sustainable energy. And when you're after changing the world in a big way with millions of physical real problems, it requires a lot of investment. And every dollar matters. It matters a lot. In fact, I think as an engineer at Tesla, you are much less comfortable um, with, with that regard um, comparing to other big companies like Facebook, um, Google, where they have a lot of resources to throw the problem. We don't have that. Efficiency matters a lot. In fact, I don't know any other companies personally in the Silicon Valley that has a very low tolerance for the bullshit. And allow it, allow it at Tesla. Because it keeps you focused on the very real problems. It pushes your uh, creativity to the limits and it keeps you in a very practical, very real world space. That's why I joined four years ago Tesla as a first data engineer. We founded a big data infrastructure team back then. I know what you're thinking, what was there before? I, I have no comments about it. I will just say that being able to make data analysis and very um, good data driven decisions is is a part of the culture at Tesla. It, it is a big deal. It is a part of uh, the product that we build, data uh, very deeply embedded there. It is very deeply embedded in engineering culture. We collect data to improve autopilot, to um, improve the hardware designs of our products, to uh, manage large battery installations. And in the past few years, uh, the number of products that we build grew significantly. It is actually exponential scale from there. And I'm not talking about just uh, Model 3 or Model Y. I'm talking about all parts of the businesses, like generation, storage, consumption, charging, even manufacturing. There are robots that are producing a lot of data. Um, and we need to somehow monitor them and make sure that they behave well. At this picture, you are looking at the biggest battery in installation in the world. It is 100 megawatt battery. It is in South Australia. Uh, Tesla built it. And within weeks, uh, Greed, Australian Greed had a problem. There was power plant issue and it helped. Within hundreds of milliseconds, it kicked in and stabilized the grid. But how do we make sure that it operates well all the time? We, let's look at the internals. What you, what you see here is a lot of fridges, right? Uh, refrigerators, looking boxes. Uh, those are what we call power packs. Inside them, there are tens of pods. Uh, there are battery modules. Inside those battery modules, there are many individual components that um, operate independently and they can fail independently. So we want to monitor them independently. And you can quickly see how all of that adds up to millions events per second, millions measurements, signals per second that we need to um, track. Um, and it's just a small portion of what we do. In fact, um, in California, we're going to build 10x uh, installation uh, comparing to this one. So one thing that we, one tool that we build to help with this task is uh, data tank is a time series store on top of HBase. Um, it is um, online time series store. It provides uh, low latency random access to the data. Uh, it's a usual uh, store, time series store. Um, it has tables with predefined schemas and queries are usual scans with filters. And it operates on top of HBase. But clients don't talk directly to HBase. 
on the produce side, uh, clients just write data to Kafka in other formats. So the right API for uh, this database is as simple as standard Kafka producer, Avro Kafka producer. We have a channel stream work, again, built in house on top of Akka uh, that ingests that data into HBase with the help of data tank library. Uh, if you know, if you want to know more about channels framework, uh, we two months ago we gave a good presentation at Kafka Summit. I encourage you to check it out. On the read side, uh, clients are talking to the web service uh, that translates queries to HBase requests, and um, you know there's a little bit of coprocessor magic. I will talk more about it. Important thing here is that um, the multi-tenancy aspect of the setup is handled outside of HBase. So we have this channels framework that uh, has a lot of knobs to configure different data streams, how we ingest them, how we parallelize them, uh, what are the limits for each of them, how they affect each other. Um, and on the read side, we have this web service that has custom logic to make sure that resources are used fairly. So that helps us to remove this burden from HBase, which is not super awesome at multi-tenant setup, um, and at the same time achieve very good numbers. So um, we, in the largest cluster, we have just 100 nodes and very commodity service, as I mentioned. Uh, they're capable, uh, cluster capable of writing 10 million events per second. And because of different SKUs and whatnot, uh, each server at peak can, can handle 1 million events per second or even more. We're a heavy write workload. Uh, so we just handle hundreds of concurrent users. Some of them are programmatic. Some of them are actual humans. Um, a team of handful, just a handful of engineers um, operates this system, and not just this system, but um, you know, as it goes to Tesla, it, we operate a lot of different other things, like for example, Kafka, HDFS, Spark, uh, Presto, and other things. So we have more technologies than people actually to operate. Uh, we build it very quickly um, into uh, engineering quarters, uh, and it took one quarter to migrate to it, and it's been in production for three years with only minor uh, fixes. So how do we do that? How do we achieve these numbers? The, the idea is very simple. What if we don't tell HBase that we're actually operating with petabytes and trillions of events? What if we tell HBase that we have millions, maybe tens of millions, terabytes, tens of terabytes? Uh, I think that makes HBase very cooperative. How do we do that? As you guess, uh, as you probably guessed, uh, the whole meat is in how we put those events into HBase. Uh, let's look at the example. Say you want to keep a table to store signals from battery. So you have device ID, timestamp, signal itself, transaction ID probably is the packet with which this data came from device. You have value, units, um, let's say this is the uh, example event. First we shard tables, we split tables in the shards. And um, a good choice is just sharded by device. I will talk more about shards later. Then within shards we split data by time buckets. And here it, it holds, uh, in this example, a thousand seconds per time bucket. Later, we slice the time bucket by indexes. And uh, we figure out what is the index. Uh, is just basically the most frequent um, queries, uh, columns that people filter by. Then we have rest of the columns. We have rest of the timestamp. We have rest of the key columns. Um, all of that determines the uniqueness of, uh, of the event and other value columns. So if you have another um, event coming in with the same, say, transaction ID, but different um, measurement, different signal, it will go into its own index, but within the same shard, within the same time bucket. If you later have a same voltage measurement, um, it will go to the same index because uh, time didn't change far enough, so it lands into the same time bucket. So this is the general idea. How do we put it into HBase? Uh, we take one index and put it exactly in a single row, which means that we have a lot of, a lot of events into one, in, in one row. We put um, other key columns uh, with time, uh, time offset into the column name so that when we write, uh, unique events don't override each other. And we put values in a value column, uh, in, in a value of the cell, and we just concatenate that. Each of them can have each shard, index, um, value columns can have multiple columns uh, and they will be just concatenated. That allows us to reduce a uh, number of rows significantly. Um, 
and we can configure per table the optimal width of the table. This is basically how many events we store per row. And usually we found that um, it is optimal when it is hundreds or thousands of them. Further, uh, to reduce RPCs, we do this very novel concept. I think we invented it, micro-batching. Uh, we use it with the help of uh, channels framework. Again, there's so many knobs that you can tweak there and you can buffer data the way you want to. And you have Kafka, so you're not losing data. Uh, it is durably stored there. Important thing here is to partition data in Kafka in a way that we are partitioning the table. So partitions are aligning with shards in the table. Then we reduce number of bytes. Uh, we should somehow tell each base that, well, they're not actually petabytes, don't, don't scare off. And um, I already talked about uh, how we group events into puts, that helps. Uh, further, we uh, don't use column names anywhere. Uh, we don't just write it to the data. So we keep it only in a table schema. There's no need to write them. Uh, then we uh, encode column values in a special way. Um, well, special, it's not really special. It's uh, what you would find in, in usual common uh, data formats out, out there, like dictionary encoding, variable int encoding, length encoding, and things like that. We can configure HBase to use fast diff encoding compressions um, that very well works with um, how our structure is and how um, repetitive our data is. And we do everything per table. Um, we configure everything per table, which helps. Uh, and in the end, uh, for a typical use case, you would only have four bytes per event even though your input is like tens of um, columns. A little bit about dictionary encoding. Um, it is by far the biggest gain that we have. Um, we replace column value with numeric ID when we know that there is not a huge cardinality. We store dictionary mappings in the same table um, so that uh, it's like self-contained in one table. Um, and we can use tools um, that are out there um, to manage tables as a whole and there's like logical concept is, is pretty simple to grasp. Like for example, if you want a snapshot table, we'll snapshot the whole table. Um, and their edge base has a lot of um, handy atomic operations out there so that you can you know, update it, update the index, update the, uh, sorry, update the mapping um, from different sources. But if you know the mapping as it happens many times, like you know the serial numbers of the products that you're producing, you can preload this mapping right there and it will save you tons of resources. Next, after reducing volumes, after reducing RPC um, numbers, what we need to do is distribute it well because even after reduced, it is still too much to handle in one region server. Luckily, we're dealing with IoT, physical world, so uh, things are predictable. Like, for example, you can look at the production ramp that is expected to be there and judge how much you um, can pre-split the table and how much you can account for it, uh, as much as you can do it at Tesla. Sometimes it is really hard. Um, and it provides you a very good way of uh, nat natural sharding of the world. And um, we don't even do salting. We keep pushing back this if feature like all the time and I think we'll never implement it, unfortunately. But we don't need it because the data is sharded very well. Um, the problem with dealing with physical world is that, you know, most of it is operated by humans. Humans are very good at um, operating in patterns. Like for example, everybody decides to go to home at, at the same time, so the commute hour is the same. Everybody wants to watch their favorite show at the same time, so like electric equipment uh, starts at the same time, so if we are watching for batteries, it kind of adds up to these high peaks of uh, spikes of uh, incoming data. And it's prohibitively expensive, um, again, every dollar matters, to size your capacity for those spikes. Um, you can do auto-scaling, uh, which is a very cool feature. Everybody is talking about it. Uh, I don't think everybody is doing it as much as they talk about it. It's very complex uh, to do in um, a stateful world, especially if HBase is not supporting it natively. We'll wait for that. Um, so before we apply all that smartness, we're asking ourselves a question, do we actually need to ingest all that data immediately? And luckily we don't because there are some things that like you know, you installed a battery at your home and you right away need to see how it works versus there are some things that can be delayed, some data can be delayed for hours to be ingested. And you can see on this chart, uh, we, are uh, we are limiting one data stream to almost exactly four million operations per second. And you can see that capacity overall is utilized pretty well. 
Now let's talk about reads. Uh, by far the best thing that you can do to help yourself operate your store is to uh, pick a right API. And uh, hopefully that API also fits well users. Um, and we have diverse users. We have, uh, you know, you name it, we have it. We, we have software engineers, if this is your lucky case. Uh, we have service technicians, we have electrical engineers, uh, we have all kinds of analysts and everybody is going directly to the data um, because everybody is smart. So we found out that REST APIs are the best suit for that, um, especially if they are self-describing, the schema tells you what you can do, what you cannot do. Um, JSON uh, response format good for uh, those who are building UIs to visualize that data. CSV for all other folks with their spreadsheets and whatnot. Um, also, what helps is to use familiar concepts, like we have, we, we call this index, which is within a shard, you have time bucket and you have index by which you uh, can filter very fast and for users it is also kind of remotely um, relates to indexes in the relational database so you can filter a bit fast. Um, we limit scope of each query to one shard. This is very important and this is, I think this saves our life. Uh, it is a, a, a huge limitation if you can think about it, but it actually helps a lot uh, us to operate it because you don't have these full table scans, you, you don't have these scans that are scanning for, panning for, in region servers for a while and killing your cluster. At the same time, uh, it helps users because they're not, they're seeing what they can do and what they cannot do with the table, what they should do and what they, what sh they should not do. Like for example, full time, uh, full table scans they should do in, in other system that we have, like a data lake. And you have Spark for that, you have Presto for that, you have all kinds of like nice tools for that. So it helps them as well. We push a lot of filtering logic to core processors because we have this uh, fancy format, um, how we lay out the data. Um, and uh, it helps us a lot, especially with uh, filtering by index columns because uh, you can instruct scanner on the region server to skip once you see that uh, this uh, row is, is not applicable to your query, then you can skip to the next one that you know will be applicable. So it helps a lot. Also, we reduce return data. Uh, we have sample query as a first level citizen. Um, a lot of times, like those guys who are visualizing data, they don't need all this second resolution. They're looking at a week of data. So they're just you know, using it natively and we reduce the size of data right there in the region server. Same things with unique uh, results at. Um, at the same time, uh, like while it helps us a lot, it also makes feel like, you know, this whole time series store is very feature rich. So it kind of helps to push for it. Not as feature rich though as relational database, unfortunately. Um, and this is the uh, usual thing from which people are migrating to data tank. Um, luckily, if you actually have a problem of scale and you want to migrate from relation database to this NoSQL store, then you're really dealing with big scale. And most of the time, your relational database will not allow you to do anything anyways. Like we had a 100 plus terabyte MySQL databases. I mean, people cannot do any joins, cannot even put any indexes there. Like it's just scanning, that's it. So people are very happy to migrate and it, it is very easy. To make sure that they are stay happy, uh, we uh, look at a couple SLOs. We provide a right SLO, which is basically about um, how fast we ingest the data, how fresh is, is the data in your table. And um, channels framework again helps with it. Important that we're not talking about how many there are records outstanding, but we're talking about the time, actual time. So when users look at the data, they know it is one hour behind or like P95 is one hour behind. And we have different tiers. As, as I was mentioning, in, in case of shaving peaks, it helps to um, have SLO hours of ingest uh, where, when we don't need to ingest it immediately. Query SLOs are a little bit more tricky uh, because tables are very unique and patterns change hourly because sometimes it is a user who is trying to type a query, sometimes it is programmatic access at night and there's just no way to, know, uh, to kind of have a average view of it. And we, we cannot manage every single table because again, we're a very small team. So what you wanna do is normalize by how much work is being done. The first you can do is how much records are returned, how much bytes are returned. It's not enough because there's some queries that are um, 
you know, skipping a lot. They're doing a lot of work, but uh, they're not returning much. So you want to actually include how much rows scan, how much uh, rows were filtered. And luckily, HB supports that. Uh, this the thing called uh, scanner stats, I believe. Um, I, I didn't know about it. I asked on a mailing list about it. And again, HBase community is so awesome. So I got a very good reply right there and I just implemented it. While normalizing works for us, like to watch for, uh, did we do something that changed query latency? It's, it may not be very handy to users because if you just give them this number and tell them, you know what, given this math, it makes sense, they will be like, okay, I don't wanna do this math. What they care about is I'm doing simple query, it runs fast. I do more complicated query, it can be a little bit slower. And this is what we do. We uh, define multiple tiers. Um, like for example, one uh, tier is small query, which is under 1000 records returned. Um, 100 kilobytes, under 100 kilobytes returned and under 10,000 records scanned. And we provide an SLO for it, P95 under two seconds. And we watch how many queries actually returned within two seconds and how many not. And we alert if there's too many not. And because different queries, the more complex queries have very variable um, um, latency, it also helps because you can define a P75, for example, for a uh, worst, uh, for the most complicated query type. We also measure availability because it is all at rest HTTP. We can do just at load balance here. We can collect how many queries failed, how many queries didn't fail, or um, timeout and, and things like that. And we can provide that. This is a real screenshot. Um, before I wrap up, um, I want to call out one more time. Uh, efficiency and simplicity matters a lot, especially in, in, uh, at Tesla, especially in a very small team. And efficiency can buy you simplicity, can buy you a lot of uh, nighttime sleep. Um, I already went through example of limiting single queries to one shard when uh, it is a limitation, yes, but it helps us. And it, we also allow users to go nuts with their queries because we, they, we know that they are constrained well. Other examples, you know, uh, there was a question on some other uh, presentation. What if you need to query it in different patterns? If Creating tables and writing data is cheap. You can just create multiple tables and just write to them, uh, to both of them. You can copy the data. Um, we have uh, built some tools that are similar to what Uber was talking about, like when we are copying with, with uh, by creating H files and then loading them, um, like bulk, load, bulk loading stuff between tables. Uh, similarly, what if you need to evolve schema? We don't support schema evolution. Uh, duplicate tables, copy data, write again in two places, then switch underneath. We have this layer in, fr in front of HBase, physical HBase tables that um, maps logical tables to physical tables. So like swapping underneath is, is pretty easy. One thing I wanna remind you is all this cool tech is, uh, is, a, big, is a part of a big puzzle. And um, the puzzle, the, the mission at Tesla is very big. Um, and I wanna thank the HBase community, Hadoop community for their contributions because those contributions help us. Uh, they help to make the planet better. So you, feel sh you should feel good about it even if you just answer some question on the mailing list. If you want to contribute more directly, shameless plug, you can think about joining our team. Now I will take questions. That means I should go, right? Yeah. <laughs> Could you like, just, like, describe a shard? It's like the concept of a table? Or? Right, so it's just a, a, a part of the first part of the key. Yeah. And um, like if you, take a, if you take that example of, okay, I got disconnected, sorry. Uh, if you have a um, part of the key that is device ID, right, then yeah. naturally your whole table is split by every device has its own range of the keys. So all your table is split in these ranges. So this is what the shard is. So it's like kind of like if you're gonna say a bin for a car, it would be like- Kind of like that, yes, like yes. That. Okay, cool, yeah. nice, thank you. Yeah, and this is like where people are usually interested in looking and visualizing the data from this data store. If you wanna um, query across it, then 
it will go to some data lake, do some Spark, do some other things. How are your users doing more analytics, or more than, let's just say, your parents, you know, your analytic users want to use that more than one record, or they only want one shot? How do they go about it, or is there a specific So, um, we allow to run many queries in parallel, so there are users who are looking at um, distinct um, population of the product. Let's say a battery is in, I don't know, Australia. I'm just making it up. So, and then they know what are those. Even, even if there are like tens of thousands of them, it's okay to run tens of thousands of scans here, right? Because it's, it's pretty fast. And fetch millions of records back. It is, um, it is doing, um, I, I'm not sure, but like you can, so you, you saw the SLOs, like you have seconds for returning a lot of data and you can parallelize it a lot. We, we, put quotas on how much each user can do. And for example, for programmatic users, like um, say tool, visualization tool that ton, uh, hundreds of people used, we create a bigger quota. For others, we create a smaller quota. But since it is like we know what is the, sh like it, limit, it is limited by shards, there's no chance it will go full table scan. We can you know, tell, allow them to run many, many in parallel. I should repeat questions. Um, so the question is how, how to avoid uh, hotspotting in a single shard. We don't do it. Like uh, we, <laughs> we, as I mentioned, we don't have salt, salting. Uh, we actually had a previous implementation of this that had salting and we just never ported it. The um, reason for that is um, within, uh, so you, you can have a hotspotting within a shard, yes, because um, you kind of monotonically um, write uh, records. First of all, they're not exactly monotonically because you have, you break them down by time buckets and then you have index and then the rest of the uh, key, rest of the uh, timestamp. So it breaks a little bit, but most of the time it would hit the same region server. But because they're physical things, uh, it's distributed pretty well. Like for example, if we are monitoring say power walls in, in your house, right? One power wall should not generate like billions of events, hopefully should not generate billions of events. So it is kind of naturally distributed. And because you know the whole space of the keys, you can pre-split it. Like for example, we pre-split tables with thousands of regions and that right away um, kind of creates distribution. We may at some point implement salting, I don't know. Like, um, we don't care about data to be written atomically. So, uh, in, two, in two places. Um, so, there is a slight chance that it will happen that um, you can write to one table but not to the other one. This is the bigger uh, problem. If you didn't write to any of them, you just replay and uh, all the writes are at um, It's just the pending things. Um, the chance is small because, um, again, we're uh, configuring this, we're using this channels framework and we're configuring it to use, usually like if you write to multiple tables, there's one task that writes to one table. So it's not like two different tasks that can be out of sync and they're writing there. So the chance is only when you're, you know, you're trying to flush to multiple regions, multiple region servers and one of them fails and you kind of an inconsistency. But um, again, the failure will be detected and the whole thing will be replayed. So eventually, you will do it. You'll be good. Okay. All right. Thank you.